Today is March 25th, 2023, and we have a very special guest on the show today, George Koo. George Koo is a journalist, social activist, and international business consultant. Dr. Koo came to the U.S. as a child from China, grew up in Seattle, and was educated at MIT Steve Stevens Institute and Santa Clara University. Dr. Koo has recently retired from a world-leading advisory services firm where he advised clients on their China strategies and business operations. Dr. Koo is also the founder and former managing director of International Strategic Alliances. He is a former member of the board of directors of Las Vegas Sands and now defunct New America Media and a current board member of Fresh Child LLC, a green building platform startup. Dr. Koo is also a frequent speaker in various public forums on China and US and US China uh, bilateral relations. Dr. Koo, uh, thank you for coming on the show and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be joining you, gentlemen. Um, so the first question we wanted to ask you today um, was about the meeting this past week between President Xi and President Putin. Um, from March 20th to March 22nd, President Xi had traveled, traveled to Moscow for what historians like Gerald Horn have stated may turn out to be one of the most important meetings of world leaders in modern history similar to, or maybe accurately a book into uh, President Nixon's trip to the People's Republic of China in 1972. Uh, what is your view of the significance of President Xi's trip to Moscow? Okay, there, there's, there's basically two ways to look at it. If you look at the mainstream Western media, they try to minimize the um, importance as much as possible. And and you know and the basis for minimizing is to say, hey, what's the big deal? Xi Jinping and um, Vladimir Putin has met about forty different times since Xi Jinping became the leader of China. So this, what's one more have to do with anything? Um, but if you dig a little deeper, the significance can be looked at in many different uh, facets. First of all. A lot has changed since the first time Xi Jinping went to Russia, which was 10 years ago, as he just came into power. He made it his point to go to China as his very first trip out of the country. 10 years later, now that he's secured on his third term of office, he made his point highly symbolic to go to Russia and meet with uh, Putin again 10 years later. So that's a that, in a way, is also a bookend. But think about how things have changed in that 10 years. At the time, China was um, not, not, not obvious that it was going to be the second largest, if not the largest economic power uh, on, in, in, or on the earth. At that time, Putin probably didn't think that seriously about the relationship with China because he was not particularly threatened uh, at that point. That is one of the important changes. Since then, of course, there's a proxy war in, in Ukraine, which because of the sanctions, because of the removal of Russia from SWIFT, economically, Russia is very dependent on China now. The, and as a result, the trade between Russia and uh, China has, oh, I, I don't remember how what criteria you can go by, but it's approaching two hundred billion now a year. And all that economic exchange, if the trade between the two countries are so complementary, it keeps the Russian economy going, and that's a very important uh, aspect. Um, China also is now very clearly a world leader, and yet their style of being a world leader is so different from the United States. It's obvious to a hundred and take a number, 160 countries in the world. It's obvious that China offers via the Belt and Road Initiative collaboration, cooperation, mutually benefit arrangements and deals. Uh, and peace. What does the United States offer? The United States offer mayhem, death and destruction, conflict. Peace is 
not in their vocabulary and not in their mindset. So when China came back just before Xi Jinping went to Moscow, they announced that they brokered a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That took everybody by surprise. It didn't just take Washington by surprise. It took the whole world by surprise because all of a sudden, there's a global power in this world that stands for peace, not for conflict. So all those things have changed in the 10 years between Xi Jinping's first trip to Moscow and the sec the 10th trip, or what, as you will, um, uh, in the recently on the deal that uh, uh, that uh, you know he uh, mentioned and visits and, and announced with the Moscow with uh, Putin. One of the quotes um, that came out of the summit between Putin um, and Z that I wanted to get your reaction to was President Z Z said to President Putin, "quote Change is coming that hasn't happened in a hundred years." And yeah. we are driving this change together. And Putin responded, I agree. What's yeah. your reaction to that? Well, I, you know, to put it in a more uh, total com context, this, is, this little dialogue took place as Xi Jinping was getting into the car and Putin escorted him to the car and was saying goodbye after about four and a half hour of conversation, very informal, friendly, conversation between the two leaders. And I think what Xi Jinping is alluding to, and of course we don't have any way of knowing what actually went on on that private conversation, but it's clear that she, after Xi Jinping as, was elected to, the, to his third term as a leader of China, he has made it very clear to the world and to the United States that this this kind of China bashing, blackening China, he's, China is no longer going to stand for it. They're not going to take it lying down. They're going to respond in kind. And every time you, the United States, steps over the line, you can expect a retaliation. So I think what he is referring to uh, in that conversation is that the relationship between China and Russia will only become stronger as they stand together to resist the American hegemony. And then you had talked a bit about China's, you know, becoming a force for peace uh, yeah. across the globe. What are your thoughts about China's 12 point peace proposal for Russia, for the Russia Ukraine conflict? Right. And right. David um, Goldman in the Asia Times wrote that he right. thought that it, it, they might be able to pull it off. What are your prospects? Or what is your view about the prospects for that piece? Well, you know, again, the West criticized the 12 point plan, and they criticized it on a, in my view, in a very specious way because they would say, oh, this 12 point plan doesn't say anything about Russia giving back territories. Uh, you know, it, th there's nothing in the deal. Well, if you, in order to have a mediation between the parties, first thing you have to do is you have to cease, stop fighting. You have to, have to have a ceasefire. All the other conditions are contingent on the both parties sitting down and talking about it and negotiating it. China unlike the United States, are not, ready to, are not ready to step in and say, hey, party A, you need to do this, party B, you need to do that. That's not in their style, and that's not what mediation is all about. That would be what, what we would call arbitration. You know, you rule in, on behalf of one or the other, but you don't have that role of trying to bring the two parties together. You're just interested in solving the problem, and you could be favoring one or the other. That's arbitration, not mediation. And I think um, there's some si positive signs out of the 12-point program. I mean, certainly, um, Putin said all the right things. You know, said he said, "Hey, this is reasonable, and we're going to think about it, and 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 we'll be ready to talk when um, 
Ukraine, when the Ukrainians are, 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 are expressing interest. And as Goldman pointed out in Asia Times, Zelensky may have reached a point when for him to continue to the proxy war, it means fighting down to the last Ukrainian. That may not be in his interest. That may be in the interest of Washington, but they keep not Kiev. And so there will come to a point where he needs to say, okay, let's sit down and talk. Right now, his attitude, at least his public attitude, is simply to say, yeah, yeah, we'll settle and talk. If you back off, if you give us uh, uh, Crimea and on and you know, put all the conditions out there. But that may be for public consumption for the benefit of Uncle Sam, because he's saying those things. But behind closed doors, he may well be thinking, how do I get out of this and come away with some kind of a, a negotiated deal that will save Ukraine from battling down to the last, last Ukrainian? And what are your sentiments? Do you think that the, there's prospects for it? Do you think it could happen? That is a very difficult question <laughs> to, to to speculate on because the, the big elephant in the room is, is Uncle Sam. And they're not willing, really not willing to see this war come to an end. Because for, for a number of reasons, first of all, the whole idea of getting the war started was to wear down Russia using the Ukrainian forces. So for Ukrainian to loot, to, to declare a settlement is telling the world that American strategy for this war didn't work, failed. Well, that's not only a blow to the American prestige, which is important, but it also ruins the credibility of the American foreign policy. And it may um, imply that it's not gonna work in the case of getting Taiwan to be uh, uh, to fight a proxy war, or even getting the Australia with their nuclear subs to fight the proxy war. You know, it's very clear, I think it's increasingly clear to the world that U.S. is unwilling to engage with their own forces, but they are perfectly willing to engage with somebody else doing the fighting for them. And that could include South Korea and Japan, Australia, Taiwan, and so on. And it's really up to these potential proxy countries to understand what they are getting into and how to avoid that kind of a trap. And what would it mean if if uh, China was able to broker peace? What would that mean in terms of China's status and this changing uh, global correlation of forces, this changing world order? Yeah. Well, I think it's what China has done with Saudi Arabia and and Iran has already made a made an important step in the direction of being the peacemaker. In contrast to the United States the war maker, so the conflict uh, supporter. And I think with each um, move, each development in that direction will enhance China's reputation uh, for peace. And and what do they, you know, the, the things that they stand for, that's very important for the third world countries to, um, <clears throat> to think about is, what they stand for is collaboration, mutual benefit, non-interference with the internal affairs of the other country, and look for uh, um, respect for the sovereignty of all the countries you'll deal with. They are non-threatening, non-interfering, and with that kind of, <coughs> excuse me, with that kind of a world, why would anybody need and feel that they need the security that the American military supposedly offers to the third world countries? Thank you. I think Ruben has the next question. Yeah. 
And so to that end, um, it seems that China is emerging not just as a counterweight to the IMF and the World Bank in terms of its yeah. Belt and Road Initiative, uh, but China is also emerging as a leader in building peace and stability around the world. They even somehow brought Iran and Saudi Arabia to the table, whereas the North Atlantic countries are moving in the opposite direction. For instance, NATO in August appears to be working against regional peace and stability in the Asia uh, Pacific. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you make of that as well? Well, I think some of it I, I, I've touched on already. Basically, you, we, we have two different poles here. The China poll is no conflict, but try to try to promote peace. And they've done that with just not with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a very important part of their um, foreign policy. And, and maybe we should spend a few minutes just go into the the Belt and Road Initiative. And then, as you mentioned, the um, uh, Asian Investment Bank, um, uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. Okay. The two things are combined. And what's interesting about the AIIB that they formed, it was formed during the Obama administration. And Obama's, the Obama White House immediate reaction was, Hey everybody, stay away from this. It's it's a it's it's some sort of a trap. And one of the first countries that jumped into AAIB was UK, because everybody else except for the United States and Japan understood that the AIIB is a winning, mutually beneficial type of operation. And of course, AIIB is, is used to finance a lot of the um, infrastructures as part of the uh, Belt and Road. And, and incidentally, one of the most interesting beneficiary of AIIB, the last time I looked, which has been a few years, was India. India got a lot of financing done through AIIB, even though India likes to play the role of taking advantage of both all the parties and not not jumped into bed with either, any, of the, uh, any of the countries. But the United States has spent so much time telling everybody, watch out for the Belt and Road Initiative. It's a debt trap. Uh, and increasingly, that particular line of uh, uh, presentation and argument rings hollow because all the countries that have been beneficiary of the Belt and Road Initiative will come out and say, hey, that's not so. Well, it's a win-win solution. And really, it, it really is a win-win solution because China will come in, they will invest, they will supply technology, they will help build the infrastructure, you know, but they get paid. It's, it's not a free deal. Now, once in a while, if it if it didn't go well for that recipient country, they might cancel that debt. Now, rather than being a debt trap, they actually gave away some of the financing. But the overall objective is is on the supposition and the proposition that if you help the economy of these third world countries, it's like a, a incoming tide raising all boats because. If they do well economically, they become customers for the goods being produced by China. And that free trade, the global free trade between uh, China and the rest of the world helps everybody. You know, un unlike the attitude that um, Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden have, which basically says, you know, if, if we buy from you and we have a and you have a trade surplus, that means that you're stealing from us. Well, that's nonsense because in the global trade, uh, it has to be a good deal for the buyer as well as the seller. So I guess that's a, sort of a long answer to what you said, what you asked, Ruben. Thank you. Um, and then just to, to follow up, um, uh, former Taiwan president, uh, Ma Ying Hu, I yeah. probably pronounced that wrong. Uh, we'll visit mainland uh, China next week. Yeah. Uh, the first such trip by a Taiwanese leader since the end of the Chinese Civil War in 1949. Yeah. Uh, 
what is the significance of this trip and um, what are your thoughts about this trip generally? Okay. A, a lot about the Taiwan situation, most American public is totally unaware of. And that includes the members of Congress, by the way. Most of them don't understand the dynamics uh, <laughs> of, US, of China and Taiwan. So forgive me if I go back a little and, and review the whole history. No, please do, please do. Okay. When, when Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang left the mainland because they were defeated by the communists and they took over Taiwan, okay, Taiwan was part of China as a result of the Potsdam Declaration at the end of World War II. The Potsdam Declaration says, Japan, you've lost World War II. You have no rights to any of the offshore islands other than the, main, the four main islands of, of Japan. So that meant the Northern Islands, Russia took over. There's a middle island in between Korea and, and Japan and the South Koreans took it over. In the case of China and Japan, Taiwan was returned to China after 50 years, there's a island called Diaoyutai, which is also called Sankaku, which the U.S. administered because they were not willing to give it back to China. And later on, they administratively turned it over to Japan without saying, hey, Japan, this is yours. They just say, you get to administer it. For that matter, Okinawa was supposed to be become a free and independent state after World War II, but somehow Japan retook Okinawa and the U.S. supported it. One of the reasons why Japan got away with some of this is because after the communists took over China, U.S. threw their lot and support Japan and did not support China. And this is where we we end up with what we are right now. The when Nixon went to China in seventy two, they Nixon was very interested in China as a ally against the Soviet Union. And one of the condition that the Chinese insisted at that time was the so called three communique that basically says. Taiwan is part of China. However, Taiwan and China become a total total entity is up is an internal affair and no business uh, of the United States. But it increasingly as the relationship between China and the U.S. become more and more jaundiced. U.S. is pushing Taiwan to become a more and more, quote, independent, okay? But still within the, within the confine of one China and Taiwan is still part of China. Now, Ma Yingzhu was the president as the KMT, the Kuomintang. He was the president just before Tsai Ing-wen was president. Tsai Ing-wen is the president of DPP, which is Democratic People's uh, Party. DPP has, by and large, um, the most pro-independence part of the Taiwan politics. KMT, during Ma ying years, recognized the One China principle, except he was politically in a fairly weak position and he was not able to move Taiwan closer to Beijing during the, uh, during the eight years that he was um, president. He only managed at the, towards the end when he was a lame duck president, he managed to meet with Xi Jinping in Singapore. But as soon as um, his turned out and Tsai Ing-wen became the um, president, she basically reneged any of the goodwill and understanding between Taiwan and Beijing and took on a quasi-independent type of um, uh, posture. Now, 
most recently, after the Ukraine war taking start to take place, more and more uh, people in Taiwan began to see the risk and danger of falling in bed with the United States. Okay. Because they can see that be, having a proxy war between 23 million people in Taiwan and 1.4 billion people in the man in China is, is, a, is a very obvious losing proposition. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. They also saw how Biden unilaterally took a part of the TSMC plant and moved it to Arizona. They also read about how some of the security experts in the United States are saying, we're going to blow up what's left of TSMC when PLA threatens to invade Taiwan. Now, in case I, I should explain, TSMC stands for Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. It has grown to be the techno technologically the leading manufacturing for semiconductor for all vir virtually all of the world. Most of the advanced chips that are designed by other people are being made by TSMC. So when TSMC moved to Arizona, Biden was able to brag and say, see, manufacturing is coming back to the United States, not mentioning the fact it's really the Taiwanese that's coming to Arizona. Uh, and there's some talk about how the Taiwanese are not into Mexican food in Arizona, but that's besides the point. <laughs> so, so we have a situation where the midterm election that took place uh, uh, about a year ago, no or less, the Ma Yingju, um, the uh, sorry, the Tsai Ing Wen's party lost a tremendous amount of the midterm election, and that's partly because Tsai Ing Wen was campaigning on the strength that. Uncle Sam have our back. We have nothing to worry about. We can continue to resist the mainland Chinese. Well, that message didn't sell in Taiwan. So at this point, why is Ma ying taking a trip to mainland China? Well, he has never said anything about the politics behind it. What he is doing is as a private individual, he is going to go to China, not identify as the ex-president of Taiwan, but as Mr. Ma or Professor Ma, because he also has a, a teaching uh, position in some university in Taiwan. <laughs> and when he goes there, he's bringing about, I think, 30 young students, college students, and they will have an exchange in the mainland China with different at different cities. They will meet with local leaders. They will not meet with um, Xi Jinping. They will not go to Beijing. They want to make sure it's not a political, uh, has a political agenda. On the other hand, <clears throat> he is likely to meet with Wang, uh, Wang Huling, Wang Huling is um, number four in the hierarchy of the Politburo. He is very unusual individual in that he came up through the ranks as an academic, as a professor, and as a strategist. And Xi Jinping has appointed him for the, for the coming term to be the one in charge of solving the cross-strait problem. So having, so having Ma Yingzhu meeting with Wang Huling is going to be a significant, but probably not a public, it will not be publicly disclosed as to what they talk about. But having the young people going to mainland, there's another message involved. Right now, there's probably over a million Taiwanese working in mainland China. They're either working for Chinese companies or they're working for Taiwan companies investing in China. Over a million. They used to, when they on vacations, like a Chinese New Year, they would go back, go home to Taiwan. But they found that when they go back, they're unable to talk about 
what life was like on mainland China. They're unable to talk about how the st standard of living has surpassed Taiwan, how everything is available in, in mainland China that's not in Taiwan. Because as soon as they talk about how great it is in mainland China, the people who has never been to mainland China would just tease the hell out of them and say, you're biased, you're being propagandist, you're being pro uh, Proto-communists, blah, blah, blah. So as a result, these people, when they go home for the lead, they keep quiet. They just keep their friendship, but don't try to persuade the local Taiwan people. But more and more people in Taiwan are understanding and recognizing that getting along in China is going to be to their benefit. <clears throat> so the message of my is you bring the young people over there is hopefully when they come back, they will influence the general public. As a matter of fact, the pro-independence sentiment in Taiwan is, is a very small percentage, maybe around 10%, maybe 15 The sentiment of pro-unification between Taiwan and China is also a very small percentage, probably even less the pro-independence type of uh, 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 sentiment. So what is the majority? The majority says, we like status quo. We want to keep it the way it is. We don't want to fight proxy wars. We, we don't want to get, we don't want to move our best and brightest workers and plants to the United States. So it will be interesting to see who is going to win the next general election in Taiwan. It's it's going to be, um, well, it's hard to say who is going to be the, leading the ticket for KMT right now. You know, it won't be Ma ying -Ju. He's turned out. It won't, and the DPP, it won't be Tsai Ing-wen because she's turned out. So it's going to be important to see what messages the two sides will bring. There's one very interesting um, development that um, probably Americans don't uh, are not aware of. Chiang Kai-shek, great grandson, and I forgot what his name is now. His name is Jiang, but I forgot. He has an English name. Maybe it's John Jiang. I, it doesn't matter. He is now mayor of Taipei, and he is oh, a wow. real comer, has chariz charisma, very realistic about what's going on, it's doubtful that he will lead the ticket because he's too young and he hasn't built up a uh, a following. Okay, but the election after this one will be interesting to watch. He could be a a, a very important factor. I guess um, two follow up questions. Uh, one, um, can you explain because uh, uh, it didn't get coverage in in the U.S. media? Explain again about the the midterms. Who right. who sort of prevailed? And then uh, the the ten percent that you said that is pro independence is that yeah. is that the elite or, or what what's the class situation of the ten percent? Um, I, I I'm I'm not sure. I I don't know that. It's 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 usually a population, you know, a poll a, a, a popular poll, and I'm not sure they really identify the economic or class background of those responding to the poll. And okay. the number goes up and down uh, in any case. Um, it's it's safe to say those who are in favor of independence have not have not gone to China, have not visited, even though tourism between the two was very popular at one point until the COVID uh, happened. The, co the last two or three years put the put the tourism down to a to a grinding halt. Um, but you know, but the exchange was was going on very very healthy pace at that point. Um, and then, uh, can you recap what happened at midterms? Well, yeah, the midterm, the midterm election has to do with le leadership of various um, municipalities and and townships and so on and so forth, and and very unexpectedly. The KMT won a great majority of, and some of the very important uh, 
townships and cities, uh, whereas the DPP, I think, only maintained control in a couple of strongholds in the southern part of Taiwan. And so that was a an indication of the Tsai Ing-wen message that Uncle Sam have our back and we can we we will be safe and we should you know be ready to combat the invading PLA Navy and so on and so forth. That just didn't resonate. Yeah. Also, in addition, of course, I should mention before the midterm, Pelosi went to Taiwan, and in spite of the fact that the Beijing protested very heavily, Pelosi went anyway. But the way that Pelosi went was very interesting. He, she went from, uh, I think it was Bangkok to Taiwan and took a huge a roundabout way to avoid the airspace of mainland China and airspace between Taiwan and China and landed in the dark of night at, uh, in Taipei just to make sure she's out of harm's way. Okay. In the meantime... China responded as they promised that they would respond. And they, for the first time, in, broke the airspace between Taiwan and mainland. They just flew over Taiwan. They didn't care what, which way they were going. They were firing missiles and landing at north of, north of Taipei, Taipei, uh, Taiwan and south of Taiwan all over a place. You know, and they, had, uh, um, they basically had Taiwan surrounded that was a scary experience for the people in Taiwan. And I think they got the message that, you know, having Uncle Sam on your back, not necessarily is a healthy type of a relationship. Thank you for explaining that. Thank, and then so um, next we have um, uh, th this, this past week, uh, there has been a thaw in relations between uh, Japan and South Korea. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what is behind this and what has been the reaction of the people in, in Japan and South Korea? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the current president of South Korea is uh, a right wing and is uh, very pro-US, um, whereas the pri prior president of South Korea was very trying to call trying to establish a bridge, a communication bridge with North Korea, President Yoon basically broke that and became very uh, uh, unfriendly, shall we say, to the North Koreans. One of the things he did that was very unusual was that he, South Korea, historically, South Korea and Japan are very dissatisfied with each other, particularly because the Japanese during World War II had enslaved South Korean women as sex slaves to to uh, you know, basically military brothels to serve the the Japanese imperial troops. It's, Korean women weren't the only ones; the Chinese, the Filipinos, and others uh, as well. But the few surviving. Uh, South Korean sex slaves had been agitating and complaining and asking for apology from Japan and asked for reparation from Japan. Japanese, their position is, oh, we've already done that. We don't need to do it again. So what did President Yoon, what he did was say, all right, I'm going to solve this problem. I will organize a fund and raise it from South Korean donations to compensate the South Korean comfort women. Well, you know that's that's worse than kissing your sister if you if you if you you know understand that kind of analogy. It's a very unpopular decision with the South Korean people. So why did he do this? Well, I suspect the United States was behind it. The U.S. is forcing Japan and South Korea to form a united front to, uh, to stand against North Korea, to stand as a potential bulwark to China, and potentially become 
um, participants of a proxy war, either with North Korea or with China or with both. So it, in terms of how the people in Japan react to this, I'm not sure. You know, it's it's the important thing was the South Korean president went against the wishes of his own people, and his popularity was low to begin with, is even lower now. It's it's hard for me to see him survive his whole term of office. Um, thank you. And so those are all the questions we have we have prepared for you today. Um, but is there anything else that you might want to add or discuss uh, before we end? I think in summary, it's very important for the American public to understand that Washington bipartisan support Biden White House, they are all leading us to war and destruction. They, ironically, right now, we are in such bad shape financially. Our dollar is losing credibility. China and Japan and all the other countries, they're trying to lighten up and not hold treasury bills because they see the dollar is weakening as we speak. Well, ironically, Janet Yellen, our Secretary of Treasury, needs people to buy our bills, our Treasury bills, buy our debt. And the biggest buyer used to be China. But in point of fact, China has been getting rid of all their debt, not you know, gradually because they can't get rid of it all at once. But in fact, they're converting a lot of the dollars into gold and shipping the gold back to uh, to to China. Yeah, and you and Japan has been lightening up. Well, we have a potential disaster here if nobody buys our bills. Secondly, our bipartisan Congress is not bipartisan when it comes to raising the debt ceiling, and if we don't raise the debt ceiling by July, August of this year, we will default. Man, if we, the United States, default on a very shaky dollar proposition as it is, that is going to be a total, that will be the end of the dollar as a reserve currency. That's the kind of things that we are facing in the abyss. And I don't understand and I don't know if our American public understand where we where we stand. You know, all the expenses going into blasting and blackening China, you know, and then all of a sudden after you curse them and 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 slander them, all of a sudden you want them to buy our bills and you want them to cooperate. It doesn't make any sense. So, I hope, I hope. That the 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 American public will and American public will understand that we are in between a rock and a hard place, and we need real leaders that can see the benefit of getting along and not the benefit of having adversaries, so we can continue conflict around the world. Thank you. We very much share your same concerns, your same hopes and your sentiments. Um, and we, we are, you know, eternally appreciative for you passing this message on to our viewers and hopefully um, your message on, on here and other platforms such as the Critical Hour, um, that, that more and more people can hear what you're talking about and learn from you. Um, and that, you know, generally this consciousness spreads. So we, we appreciate it and hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, gentlemen.